Hello and welcome everybody uh, to the next installment of the IIPP series on public purpose in the time of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Reiner Kattel, I'm professor and deputy director at IIPP and I will be chairing today's discussion. And uh, as, uh, as, uh, as you heard before, we have um, a lot of the talks have, have happened over the last um, yeah, two months really, and you can find those uh, recordings on our website. So please, please visit our website for the recordings and, and also for the future talks. And also you can find a number of, um, of policy briefs uh, that we have uh, been writing about uh, COVID-19 on our website and also wider research and, um, and uh, op-eds and similar articles that we have been writing on, on COVID-19 on our website. So please visit um, these websites. And as you heard, again, I encourage you to send in your questions and comments during the, uh, the talk. So because we, we will try to keep it very conversational. So we'll, we'll try to get as many to your, com to your comments as possible. And as you know, today's discussion is really about uh, the role of the digital has played in, in COVID-19 responses. And, and as you, I'm sure you have read and heard discussions and, or have, have been thinking about it yourselves, uh, you have seen that COVID-19 has in many ways amplified uh, many of the issues um, around digital economy, for instance, the monopoly power of uh, big tech companies, the issues around privacy uh, or the lagging government capabilities in developing um, digital tools and apps and whatnot uh, to help out with COVID-19. And also, of course, the, the digital divide uh, between those who have access uh, or can work from home and those who don't have access or can't work from home. And, and there are um, obviously clear signs that uh, the technology sector is becoming uh, more and more important. So if you look at the stock market, for instance, in the US, the, the large tech companies have, um, have almost never been as, as important on the stock market as they are now. So there is this, uh, you know, moment that, that we, we are arguably in uh, that the digital uh, capitalism and, uh, and, uh, and economy at large is sort of at a, 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 like, a, like a rupture point where governments can actually change course and try to steer uh, the digital capitalism in, in a different and less value extractive um, course, if you will. And I'm very happy that, um, that today we are discussing exactly this um, question, whether governments are actually doing that, are they willing to and are they able to size this opportunity and, and shape the digital markets, if you will. And I'm very happy that I'm joined by uh, two uh, global experts in this. First of all, I want to introduce Francesca Bria. Francesca is an uh, innovation economist and digital policy expert whose work is located at the intersection of technology, geopolitics, and the economy. She is uh, the president of the Italian Innovation Fund, uh, the largest national fund to develop and grow the Italian innovation and venture capital system. Uh, previously, Francesca was chief digital technology and innovation officer at the city of Barcelona and, uh, and chief um, and senior program leader at Nesta, uh, the UK innovation agency. And uh, in 2017, she founded the Decode Project, which is funded by the EU, EU and it's, it has a great website, so you can check it out. And, and this project created tools to give uh, individuals more control of what happens with their personal data. And she's also currently a, a senior advisor on digital cities and digital rights for the United Nations. And of course, foremost, she's also professor, honorary professor at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose. And, um, um, our next uh, second guest is um, uh, also Italian, <laughs> but, uh, but working in a, in a very non-Italian environment. So Giulio Giudotto uh, is, a, is a head of uh, Innovation Center at uh, UNDP uh, Asia Pacific, and he's an expert in social and international development aspects of innovation. And in, a role, in his role at UNDP, um, he works with governments across the Asia Pacific region to develop innovative capabilities and generate solutions to complex uh, development challenges. He's also a research associate at MIT with a focus on user-driven innovation. And previously he has worked at uh, Climatic, which is an European agency 
and also as an innovation advisor to the Prime Minister office in the UAE. And in, her, in his pre previous career, he has also worked at, uh, again, Nesta, Worldwide Fund uh, for Nature and, and World Bank as well. So I'm, I'm very happy that, that both of you are here. And, uh, and as I said, we'll, we'll try to focus this uh, discussion around global solutions and global discussions and issues, if you will. And my, uh, my first question uh, comes from, from sort of my introduction that many, many of us see COVID-19 as this sort of a rupture point in history when a lot of people are writing and talking about, we don't want to go back to the normal, uh, to the pre-crisis normal. And of course, in many ways, it talks about both uh, the capitalism in a wider sense, but especially, I think, the, the green aspects of it. But also, of course, there's a lot of talk about digital government, digital capitalism. And my first question to you both is that, do you see uh, this happening also around uh, digital government or digital capitalism? And, and how do you see uh, the COVID-19 impacting the discussions we, have, we had before the crisis? So Francesca, first, if you want to go first, perhaps. Sure. So first of all, thank you very much. And thanks everyone uh, that are following this uh, uh, debate that I hope to be very lively. So I hope there's going to be interaction from the audience as well, because actually I think uh, the stakes are, are very high and it's not only going to be governments that are going to have to harness the possibility of turning uh, what is a tragedy into a, an opportunity to set uh, the direction of the future technological development and its economic agenda. But I think it's going to be a collective effort and this collective effort is going to be a societal large scale intervention, if you wish. And I'm very pleased to talk to Giulio, which of course, I mean, we are two Italians, but actually uh, not to worry because we are engaged and active in very different areas and very different regions. So I hope you're gonna bring different, um, also um, uh, territorial, uh, perspective on this question. So I'm obviously based in Italy now and very European and I've been working a lot in Europe in the last years. So I, I guess my perspective is going to be a bit Eurocentric if you want, which I don't know if it's a good thing for a British audience, so hopefully not all a British audience. Um, so I will start from your first point and then we'll look more into digital capitalism. So I think obviously we are still in a very a big uh, shock and a very big emergency uh, situation. And I think that the deeper is the crisis, the more likely is that people are not asking for uh, back to normal or for normal kind of uh, solutions, but something different and something better. So I think we have to leverage this question, uh, this also expectation uh, that is coming from society. And uh, we should be asking at this point if COVID can reconfigure our societies. So if uh, we are able to turn this tragedy into a lifetime opportunity uh, to rebuild better economies. And I think this is uh, a very big uh, question, which also means that basically we cannot say we go back, we only act on the short term to fix what's, what's as being, what it is a current emergency, but going back to the situation that actually contributed to get to this crisis. But we have to have the courage to set uh, the terms for long-term intervention that actually are gonna bring us to a different future that is greener, that is more digital, and that is, that, that, that it is about social justice. And I think um, in a certain uh, way, this is what the EU recovery plan is trying to do. So I think in this, uh, in this moment, we see a very active role for, for, uh, from um, uh, states, at least at the European level, I mean, not only called, of course, to manage this pandemic in an unprecedented way, in a unprecedented way and also to realize the importance of public uh, sector systems from healthcare to education to basic uh, infrastructures of society in such a moment. But also, I think really we can see a much uh, more revitalized role of the state also in the economy. So uh, we, we see basically no business as user, 
usual, but um, a, a need for a, let's say, more strategic intervention to redesign the, the economy in general. Also with, with, with different ways that the states are entering into the economy, you know, getting uh, uh, stakes, of um, and shares of strategic industries, loosening the, the kind of antitrust regime globally, and also you know, having a much more uh, active role in shaping industrial policy, which is something we have not seen before very much. And I think uh, the, the question of, uh, let's say, European um, technological sovereignty or digital sovereignty, which also means, of course, being able to regain democratic control of technology and uh, critical infrastructures of the future, connectivity, artificial intelligence, and data, it's very much linked to the ability of society to mobilize those infrastructures to serve people. And which also means to address the big missions that we are facing as society. First of all, of course, climate change and the kind of decarbonization and greening of our economy, but also more social justice and uh, income inequalities and economic polarization, which is actually worse than during this crisis. So getting a, a bit more into the question of uh, digital capitalism, I think obviously during this pandemic, we have seen a kind of forced digitalization or digitalization of many aspects of our life. So we have increased our smart working, I mean, in the public sector and in the private sector, we have seen a rise of digital education or di distance education. So schools, obviously, I mean, it's, it's months uh, that they're working in, in a different way using digital tools. Uh, the use of digital platform for food delivery, but also in general, a strong reliance of society on essential services, which are delivered by gig workers of large digital platforms. And if we look at the data, we saw a 20% of increased sales uh, from e-commerce or digital services, including also digital payments. So, and, and, and this without considering the massive role that data and digital tool play, played also to solve the uh, health care crisis during the peak of the pandemic. So we saw, um, you know, uh, the, the display, I mean, the, the deployment of contact tracing applications in many of the countries around the world and definitely uh, many of the European countries, but also using data uh, daily to connect uh, healthcare services, to monitor the pandemic, uh, to monitor also uh, logistics. I mean, mobility data of telecom operators were very essential to see uh, what what was working about the containment policies to, to kind of tackle outbreaks of the virus. So these have seen a kind of increase, really massive increase throughout society of digitization in a way that we haven't experienced before. So what, what it's really, uh, and also, I mean, this has also been stressing a lot our infrastructures. So one, I think, key issue that we could discuss a little bit more is, um, of course, all of a sudden, uh, the need for public broadband and universal ultra broadband acceleration of the deployment of 5G network, investment into cloud computing and data have become suddenly national priorities. So even countries that were very much lagging behind realize that those are infrastructures that are very fundamental to the operation of society and they're critical and they should be deployed and they should be serving society. So of course, a very big question there is about what it means democratic governance of those infrastructures because of course, as uh, Rainer, you said at the very beginning, a lot of those infrastructure are in the hands of very strong um, platform monopolies. So I think uh, a, a very important point that I, I will close here is that, um, well, basically, uh, we need to be careful that this massive digitization will not create new disequalities, so new fractures in society, a new concentration of power and wealth, uh, with also a lot of problems when it comes to uh, the uh, political agenda, which is on one side, of course, accelerate digitalization, but on the other side, as I said a very, at the very beginning, give it a direction. Because the problem now is not only digitized, so give to more power to the GAFA, 
uh, give more power to the uh, equivalent Chinese monopolies. But the question is, how do we direct this technological transformation to achieve both social and environmental sustainability? And I think there, you know, what worries me is that probably if we look at the economic situation for the large GAFAM companies, so the, the kind of Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft of our world, this viral pandemic has been a shock, but a positive shock. And this is the difference with the rest of the economy that is struggling to keep up and struggling to survive. So you mentioned that, uh, you know, in this period, the big tech companies have even accelerated the investment and acquisitions, amassing huge financial resources. They have um, increased the value of their share, shares by, by more than 20 percent. I mean, Amazon alone has added 400 billion US dollar in stock market capitalization, and the GAFAM companies together increase, I mean, reach a liquidity of 516 billion US dollars. I mean, this is the GDP of Sweden. So this basically, if you look at these players, which are reaching a total market evaluation of 6 trillion US dollar, obviously we are observing a concentration of unique power and wealth in recent history. And I think that on top of that, obviously, we see that the war of, uh, about digital supremacy, which now is basically a war on digital competitiveness, national security between two regions of the world, the US on one side and China on the other side, has increased also in this, in this moment. And now we have a new scenario where you know, the questions around who will control next generation um, network infrastructures like the 5G or next generation microprocessors and chips and obviously who will control data and artificial intelligence are fundamental geostrategic questions that need to be addressed in the long term. So coming back to my first uh, obviously remark and uh, Europe to, to, to take a perspective about what Europe um, should be done. I think that uh, we should make a step forward and instead of just being at the avant-garde of a movement that try to regulate the tech companies, and I think we are also seeing now with Margaret Vestager speeding up uh, questions around competition and antitrust, uh, digital taxation, but also more responsibility of the tech companies on content of their platforms. So these are all questions that probably we can debate during the conversation. I think that Europe should do a leap forward and, and uh, really strengthen a more common pan-European industrial policy which looks at technology, science and, and data as the very core of what we need to be doing. So we need to create not only uh, rules uh, that can be applied to um, globally, but we need to create uh, a kind of European uh, industry and European capacity on top of which we can then, uh, you know, develop a digital ecosystem based on, uh, you know, democratic control and more, uh, um, and, and, uh, and actually tailor this technological development to, uh, first of all, the Green New Deal. Right. So, so I think these are some of the questions that I think uh, can be observed. Yeah, th thanks so much for painting such a large canvas of, of issues and discussions, and I think especially from the European perspective. So, Julia, I mean, thanks for staying up for first of all, and uh, because you're sitting in a, in I think in a very in a very different situation in, in Bangkok, in Thailand. So, how does this uh, look from your perspective, uh, the crisis and the digital responses? Thank you, Ryan, and thank you again for the invitation to take part in this. Um, let me maybe start from uh, uh, saying the part where I think Francesca and I totally agree, which is if there is an appetite to change fundamental paradigms, this will have to be a, a societal issue. It's not only governments, it's different level of society that we need to start a different type of conversation. And it seems to me that part of the appetite for radical or uh, change uh, will come depending on which narrative will be the one that uh, represents what represents success in terms of actually what is the COVID response, whether it is the health uh, emergency first or uh, the economic recovery eventually. And this is where I think sitting uh, in Asia and for working for a development organization, this is actually quite interesting to watch because, of course, on the one hand, uh, many of what have been touted as the success stories, at least when it comes to 
the health response so far have come from this region, uh, all the way from New Zealand uh, to Vietnam. Uh, and, and so, you know, it does this actually encourage uh, a big discussion about changing radically models when actually things seem to have actually worked reasonably well. That's an interesting question in terms of building political will uh, and also what is uh, the acceptance of a population in this case. Now, from, from my perspective, and again, so looking at it from, from a base in Asia and a development organization, really uh, the, the question that Francesca alluded to in terms of actually what represents critical infrastructure is really one of the critical things that have come out uh, of uh, in the last few months uh, from a number of very different type of perspectives. Uh, and this is also where your question around re thinking digital capitalism and what are what is the appetite for big change i think that's a, a useful place to start looking at it so for to start to begin with what is critical infrastructure is it uh, health is it uh, education is it food uh, is it information literally having access to the information so if you are don't have access to a mobile phone or whatever you don't know about social distancing if you are living in, in places where you don't, or you might have a mobile phone, but you are illiterate, so you know you don't have access to a vital information in many different ways. Now, recognizing uh, digital, for example, as critical infrastructure uh, is uh, going to be something that needs to be recognized by law. Um, and so, this, is there be going to be appetite after this crisis to do so? It seems to me, yes, increasingly. And there are some really interesting questions that follow up fairly practically from that. So, for example, uh, when uh, uh, cash transfers were, uh, which was a, a big part of a, of a uh, response of many governments in this region to uh, COVID and we were able to be distributed digitally, uh, if uh, governments were not able to uh, nominate uh, digital companies a digit as a part of a critical infrastructure, this would actually, this company would have stopped to operate under lockdown conditions. Uh, and by the same token, for example, we would have to uh, charge uh, a percentage for each cash transfer that was being done. Uh, nominating this type of infrastructure as critical infrastructure uh, gets you away from some of these restrictions or the possibilities of doing things. Uh, so there again, so you know, just the fact that digital could be by law recognized as digital infrastructure moving forward will be a change in itself. But then there is also other fundamental question is that uh, the, the lower the state capacity, the more in these circumstances you have uh, the necessity to rely on private sector company to step in and do what the state is not able to do. Uh, and, and it's interesting for me if you look at some of the examples of uh, successful responses in this region and you know two examples could be uh, Vietnam or the state of Kerala which uh, against what has happened in the largest part of India has actually had a very successful response. Uh, this is because they had done previously a fundamental big investment among others in their health sector. So, you know, this was the critical infrastructure they invested in, and then digital, of course, allowed to do more things on top of it, but without that foundational investment before, it was not, would have not been possible to do it. So the question then, if you recognize digital as critical infrastructure, then goes back to the question that Francesca is raising, right? Who owns it? Uh, and is this a time to uh, have a, a new public-private dialogue in terms of what it means to run infrastructure, what to do with it. Here again, depending on the capacity of a state and the options that you have, you might be, for example, completely reliant on WhatsApp or Facebook to do all your campaigns, right? Uh, and you don't have other channels uh, um, to use, literally to reach the majority of your population. What are the implications of this? The fact that what kind of uh, regulations do you put in place? Can you put constraints uh, on the big platforms for inter or interoperability, for example? All are these big questions that are coming out of, of this um, uh, crisis for me, but also interesting and different roles depending on sectors, right? So for example, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Airbnb has made available uh, vacant homes for first health respondents. 
Now, again, how do you look at something like this, right? Providing critical infrastructure in the moment of need done by a private sector company. Uh, Pinduoduo in China is a company that has worked with a lot of, um, which is, uh, Pinduoduo is fundamentally an e-commerce platform that reaches the most rural areas. And uh, uh, they have been able to actually strike agreements with local governments and uh, enable farmers to sell directly to people in cities um, at a moment where supply chains would have been other. Uh, again, what does this teach us about changing the role of public and private sector? Indonesia has created almost overnight a telemedicine and telehealth sector, uh, relying uh, largely on startups uh, and under condition of duress, uh, you know, on uh, you know having to to really um, reinvent very creatively procurement on the spot, public procurement on the spot. Uh, again, uh, big questions here to be asked in terms of what is the role of a state in shaping a particular market under condition of emergency, uh, what are the, the forced experimentation that becomes a new normal moving forward, uh, what are uh, key core processes of government to influence this, like for example procurement to do this. Uh, another question, which I think, again, I'm just following this theme of a critical infrastructure, because for me, this has become really quite fundamental in this region anyway, is a critical infrastructure for whom, right? So uh, if you are a middle class person sitting in Bangkok or in Jakarta or in New Delhi, uh, critical infrastructure for you might be the, the platform, the gig workers, uh, whether it is domestic cleaners, whether it is the people who bring you the food, Etc. And obviously, this has generated another aspect, uh, I guess, of digital capitalism, right? Is what has happened to these workers that um, all of a sudden have become critical, but certainly don't have a social protection uh, um, across the board to actually, pro to actually uh, justify the state of being critical that way, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously, if you are uh, a poor person who doesn't have access to an ATM and uh, is living in a slum, uh, your definition of critical survival infrastructure is really quite different. Uh, and here again, I think uh, a debate on, on this, what does this actually look like, what are the dimensions of it? And I think, you know, for us in the development sector, it's been a very well-known fact that we keep falling in this trap, which we look at access to digital as being automatically saying an ability to actually use digital tools effectively. Now, this has proven over and over again not to be the case, right? So we have uh, tons of examples. We um, collected a number of stories from governments, uh, what has happened. So, you know, whether in India it was because of uh, different languages being spoken, or the fact that, for example, the crisis was so bad that people who theoretically had access uh, to government services through digital means, through mobile phones, but they didn't even have the money to make a call to activate the service. If I had the money, but they were illiterate, I couldn't even send an SMS, right? So we learned these lessons all over and over again, but we still tend to focus a lot on access. And actually there's a number of other conditions that make uh, you know, digital capabilities uh, effective or possible. The only final thing I would say, and uh, you know, maybe it's something uh, for a different type of discussion, but again, if you include then digital into your definition, of critical infrastructure, then what are the possibility of uh, misuse of this infrastructure? Uh, and this we have seen in many different forms and shape during this crisis, right? So uh, obviously everybody talks about the infodemic. Uh, and again, uh, here, whose responsibility is it um, to set the record straight, who owns the truth, quote unquote, um, what are the issues that one needs to put in place? And again, if your public, if your infrastructure this way is owned by the private sector, do I share the same sense of responsibility? How do you regulate that? And also more insidious things uh, in terms of actually who owns, uh, you might have seen at the moment, India has banned, for example, all Chinese apps. Now that has nothing to do with COVID ostensibly, but there is a big question about uh, can actually uh, states, and you know, there seems to have been a number of examples, uh, for example, spreading misinformation about uh, the disease uh, as part of cyber attacks, or at least attempts of generating uh, uh, 
different dynamics in other countries. So we saw questions about uh, how do you regulate that and uh, what are the conditions to put in place to protect the critical infrastructure if you recognize it as such from its use, I think is another important set of questions coming out of this crisis. Thank you so much, Julia. As well. so I think there is a, from both of your um, first sort of responses, if you will, the, there are like two, for me at least, two or three major issues emerging. One is uh, that Francesco was talking about the essential economy, if you will, the essential part of the economy and how the digital related that. And Julia, you were complementing that with the idea of critical infrastructure, which is, again, how do we, how do we think of that, especially the digital critical infrastructure, and the relation to the, what, we, what we think of as an essential. And I think that underlying both of your uh, thoughts is, uh, is something that you, Julia, and I think Francesca as well, talk directly to is this, to the reformulation of public-private discussions around data, digital, whether we see it in a, in a form of the power of big tech com companies, whether we see it in a form of, of developing uh, new solutions or about uh, fake, fake news, all of those issues. So there is an underlying discussion and my, my next question to both of you is actually um, looking from this perspective of needing to reshape the, the way public and private sectors talk about digital and discuss it. Uh, do you see any emerging new long-term solutions or are we still in this very first quick response uh, phase where you know some, some governments are respond uh, are doing hackathons, some governments are, are just using the critical infrastructure they have uh, to push out the money that people need or, or do something that is just uh, you know emergency response. But do you see also something emerging, some solutions, some dialogues emerging between in public and private sectors in some countries perhaps or on, on a global UNDP level perhaps that, that we can think that could be used as, as blueprints for the next five, seven, whatever years to reshape those dialogues. Is there anything that we can sort of hang on to now? Hmm. Right. Um, well, first of all, I think I want to uh, be more specific about a couple of points that for me we should be addressing. Uh, for me, the question at the moment, which is uh, very clear, it's not so much, I mean, it's not only the relationship between uh, public and private, uh, that I think need to be reconfigured with new ambition and new, uh, I mean, for me, when we talk about the uh, critical digital infrastructure, which obviously is a lot of things in there, you know, from the network to the connectivity, to the data, to the supercomputing, to the clouds, to, you know, I mean, there is a lot of different layers and a lot of different technologies uh, involved. So there is not one digital thing. Uh, you can only address it properly with the question of uh, industrial policy, because again, um, I mean, the level of investment, resources, capabilities, and ambition required uh, need to mobilize resources and will from public and private at, at a very large scale at this point. And I think uh, what we are also seeing is a geostrategic question that we have to put on the table. It is not only private and public. I think that there is a specific uh, regions, I mean, the US versus China, which at this point are governing the majority of this, uh, I mean, the majority of these companies are either American companies or Chinese companies. And obviously, if you are uh, from, um, I mean, a different country or a different region, and if you have much less capabilities, it's much more difficult uh, to, uh, you know, address questions of um, liability of contents, of digital taxation, of, um, of, of privacy and security and fundamental rights, because basically you're dealing uh, with companies that obey to a different jurisdiction. And also, I think, that uh, there is a lot of concerns uh, uh, from the regulators and policymakers at the moment that the concentration of digital markets, which is huge, I mean, is unprecedented. I mean, we're going to get to the, they are too big to fail, they are too big to be uh, oriented, they are just too big uh, to, be, um, to be governed. Uh, they can, I mean, this situation can seriously jeopardize the industrial position of um, European industries in key sectors and create almost like new colonialism 
So when I talk about digital sovereignty on one side, we also have to talk about what's the new digital colonialism that is resulting from this concentration of power. And, and um, so I think that at the moment, for me, one important part is that uh, we need to, um, to basically integrate the question of technological policy and digital infrastructures within the new industrial policy of Europe. I mean, in particular now that there is a, a lot of investments which are mobilized, for instance, with the green recovery plans or uh, new public and private infrastructures in technologies that will determine the future of industries and society. For instance, you know, electric vehicles, uh, new hydrogen, is this is investment in new uh, mobility, uh, into hydrogen as a new uh, mobility technology or electric batteries, but also the question around cloud technology. That for instance, now uh, France and Germany are, are trying, they came up with this new uh, project that is called Gaia X, where they want to kind of um, contrast the supermarket hegemony of a few firms. I mean, today they released a, a kind of table where you see that European cloud are basically uh, dominated by US companies. And now there was an internal report from the European uh, data protection authorities, which is saying, well, these companies are actually not obeying to the GDPR which means, okay, if you have a very advanced progressive regulation, which says we want to combine innovation with fundamental rights, privacy and security of citizens being fundamental to the type of innovation that we want to achieve in the future, you cannot do it with such business model. So you're gonna have to modify the business model uh, opening the black boxes of those uh, algorithmic black boxes of those companies, which of course is going to be very difficult. So Ms. Vestager, again, she's trying with competition rules and antitrust, but it is very hard to do it only with that kind of tools. So you're gonna have to step in with a more, I think, uh, clear industrial policy in order to set the next generation uh, innovation um, to, to create companies that, I mean, sorry, I talked about, a lot about Europe. I mean, Julio should give a different type of perspective, but you know, uh, we want to see made in Europe companies. I mean, we want to see uh, new companies that can disrupt this monopoly. So, I mean, the, really the question of geography, I mean, geostrategic um, dimension here should, is very central because at this point, I mean, Julio said, uh, India has forbidden a Chinese technologies. I mean, actually, the UK has forbidden Chinese technology in the 5G. I mean, 5G is the next real big thing. I mean, uh, the, the, the White House has released a paper where they said that they are even looking into entering, I mean, buying, you know, Ericsson and Nokia, which are two uh, European companies because uh, they, the US doesn't have operators that could, you know, compete with the Chinese in the 5G. So it is going to be also this question about uh, microprocessors and, and um, next generation chips and hardware. So this is critical questions that need to be addressed. And I think Europe should have the ambition to uh, propose a different model of innovation and to do it in their own terms, because otherwise we depend too much on companies that are very hard to regulate. I mean, this doesn't, I mean, of course, having said that, it doesn't mean that you do not want public and private sector collaboration. That what, that's what I'm saying. Actually, public and private sector collaboration is absolutely essential. But you need to do it on the terms uh, which are set by society. So, so you need to take back that kind of leadership. And um, so I want to add that, and I, so maybe I'm a bit romantic here. I'm an idealist. I mean, I'm, I want to be positive about the fact that it is possible to have a, a next wave of innovation that is about um, data sovereignty, privacy, security, and fundamental rights, that it, it is directed to solve you know, climate and to decarbonize our economy. It is directed to create value and public value in the real economy. Yes, it should be possible, and we have to give any, I mean, we have to give a contribution in that direction. And then I just wanted to uh, comment on the state capacity or the public or even societal capacity, as, as Julio um, put it. Because, yes, I think actually that uh, you started to mention public procurement as a possible leverage to, 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 to acquire capabilities. I also think that this is uh, very 
very essential. So um, actually, I mean, now that we have a non I, mean, I don't know if it's the same, Julio, in other regions of the world. I mean, here we have trillions <laughs> being unleashed into the economy. I mean, of course, I, I, I've seen um, the same kind of ambition in other countries. There is a, there is a lot of money mobilized into the economy. And I think uh, we, if, if we, we say it needs to be directed to the, you know, to the Green New Deal and to social justice and to digitalization that is more sustainable, we have, we have to make sure that we put this ambition into the, into the contracts that we write with these companies. So for instance, Mariana, she's the director of the I, IPP, she always talk about clauses regarding the bailouts. So how do we make sure that if we bail out companies, we also make sure that we have a, a, a innovation in governance. And so the, the, this money doesn't go in, uh, in, um, in tax havens, or that you know they the companies have clear commitment to decarbonize, and so if we're giving a bailing out airline industries or big car companies, we can be sure that you know we push them towards becoming more green with clear targets and the incentives are present in the financial structure of the even the compensation structure of the management of those companies and share buybacks and all of this and i would say why don't we put also these clauses in the public procurement contracts so in the case for instance of gaia x which is this ambition of having a european federated open source cloud with data sovereignty we should put those standards, so standard setting is another, is another very important part. I mean, this is what the Chinese are doing with 5G, uh, being very present in international standard setting um, boards and organizations. Why don't we put those clauses and those standards in public procurement contracts? And then we harmonize public procurement rules, and so we shape and create new markets. So these new markets then will follow these kind of guidelines that are the policy and industrial policy objectives that we are setting. So I think, uh, well, try to do this uh, would be uh, would be some a step forward when it comes to progressive policy making in this area. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So I think I think it's a very very important intervention in terms of bring it back to the industrial policy as such. And of course, Julia, you are working in a region where industrial policy probably has never been a bad world. In, in contrast to Europe, where perhaps for the past 30 years, it has been a bad world. And now it is changing with some countries like Germany, of course, being very, very keen to again sort of use industrial policy. And, but from your perspective, is um, how does this um, sort of the emerging new public-private landscape, which is very different already, from the beginning has, has, has been changing or shaping up? There's a, a number of very interesting um, questions that this raises, right? So what are the instruments and what are the places where this dialogue happens? Uh, so as Francesca said, you know, industrial policy, um, uh, innovation policy, uh, a number, you know, right now with decisions that are being taken on stimulus packages, uh, Korea was the first government to have a COVID election and actually it won it on the agenda of doubling down on this uh, new new green deal, right? So uh, there's elections happening, right? But some of these discussions are happening. So it's, it's interesting to think through where these, these things are being renegotiated uh, in the country. And I, I think um, in, uh, in Asia, in many places, the feeling is uh, a bit of a deja vu in the sense that uh, there is, uh, you know, a very fresh memory in many countries of a SARS uh, pandemic, which is also, you know, some people have attributed one of the reasons why some things uh, have worked more effectively in this part of the region, at least in places, in terms of a response. Uh, so to give you an example, again, Korea, that has been one of the uh, success stories, of, at least from a health response at the beginning, uh, one of the things that happened as a consequence of, uh, 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 of a SARS pandemic is that they actually completely changed their uh, emergency pandemic response law, which means that, for example, they can activate uh, thousands of what we call uh, uh, epidemic intelligence officers that have access to data from credit cards, from mobile phones, etc., under special conditions of, uh, 
of a pandemic. Um, now, obviously, this raises an awful lot of questions, right? Uh, but at the same time, it gives you an idea of, of a different type of agreement, if you want, between the public and the private sector under a particular set of, of uh, circumstances. Uh, private sector companies in Korea have given their facilities uh, to actually uh, provide it for people that were quarantined. Uh, you could go to a website and see the movement of people uh, that were infected uh, and see whether they, you might have had a chance to get uh, in touch with them, right? So, uh, and all of this was possible because of these provisions that were taken uh, in, the, in the response to the past uh, pandemic. Uh, what questions does this raise? What is the role of public, private, etc.? Uh, but clearly, this was something, some, some type of important uh, consequence of that. And then also on a different side, uh, uh, for example, the Korean government was able quite effectively to uh, procure uh, equipment by changing its procurement rules so that you could guarantee bulk, equip bulk purchase of particular equipment, thereby crowding in potential private sector companies. And again, they released their data uh, so that actually startups, private sector companies, etc., could build application on it, which meant that people knew where their masks uh, were available and things like this, right? Something like that is happening in Taiwan as well. So uh, if you take an example like that and you start to say, okay, does this actually uh, point to a potential different future, at least under scenarios of pandemic? Um, maybe. Is this an example that one can look into? There are questions to be asked, uh, things that, uh, you know, probably for other uh, conception of privacy and things coming from other jurisdictions, which would uh, raise lots of, of questions. Uh, and, and, and you know, to, to start having that dialogue, right, at many different levels across society where it is possible to do so. Um, you know, the other question which obviously has come up and again, so when you're looking at where some of these things might or might not change, I think health has been a sector where we've seen really uh, fairly dramatic, particularly telehealth and telemedicine. And, uh, this, this, I was mentioning the case of Indonesia, but for example, we ran a, a podcast called The Innovation Dividend, uh, trying to interview policymakers that were in the thicket of a response to see what kind of questions and decisions they had to take in response to COVID. Uh, and one of this is with uh, one of our colleagues actually in Bangladesh, where they created, again, almost overnight, uh, you know, what they refer to as a, a sort of a pooling up for doctors, uh, where they trained uh, 15,000 doctors and nurses overnight to be able to be on call to provide uh, support with medicine. Is this actually a new way of thinking about the delivery of medicine moving forward? Does this tell us about, you know, again, it's public and private working together. Uh, they created by the same token, a new set of e-commerce functions because people were not available, uh, were not able to get their provisions. Otherwise, we call it p-commerce, right? Phone commerce uh, related with, uh, with a number of private sector companies. So you can see that there is the beginning of new business models, new way of doing things. The question here is, is this done on, I think, on a paritetic, so, so you know, is state and private sector companies on par terms and able actually to negotiate on, on equal terms. And again, both because of the conditions of uh, pressure under the response and uh, the sense often that government has that they're playing catch-up games when it comes to the, the private sector which somehow has lower sector expertise, depleted expertise, etc. It seems to me that these ne negotiations are often not uh, done on, on peer terms and I think this is where some of the imbalances that Francesca was alluding to start to come up. Um, the other thing which I think if you again you asked us for points of where things might change moving forward, right? It does seem to me that one of the big things coming out of the pandemic is that in this relation there is also a different role for citizens that self-organize and provide uh, responses uh, both to the government and interact with the private sector in a different way. Uh, in uh, West Java, the modeling uh, that actually led to the lockdown has been done by uh, uh, an army of volunteers because the government literally didn't have the capacity to do the modeling. 
they provided, they went and presented together a number of companies to the, to, to the uh, governor and said, look, this is a scenario unless you do lockdown. And the government was opening, governor was open enough to actually accept the recommendations. So these are, these are quite extraordinary things now. Does it, and if you look at it, at the grassroots innovation that is uh, coming up out of a response of COVID, does that also lead us to a different way of thinking about uh, cooperation moving forward? Maybe, question mark. Uh, the final point I would like to make, because this has been uh, uh, a big source of debate, I guess, is uh, tracing apps, right? And all the debate around it. And uh, I think you've seen it, there's been a really strong debate about the, the Google app decision to move into this space. Uh, following a, you know, a decentralized model that on one hand, you know, protected privacy, but it was a decision of a company. Uh, it was not a societal debate on which direction and who should, where the privacy, which model of privacy protection should be done. Uh, and this has, you know, raised some interesting questions from this. But uh, well, I think that I really appreciate it is when the government of Singapore came out with its own uh, uh, mobile app for tracing, uh, it came out with a blog called It's Not a Panacea. It basically said we are extremely proud. Uh, so you cannot, actually it says, you cannot big data your way out of no data. We are extremely proud that unlike the private sector, our mobile app has been developed with uh, the health specialists and in conjunction with them. Um, and they, they basically, but that is a strong statement from a government and the team that clearly has a very strong sense of purpose and ability to negotiate and say what is possible and what is not, right? So I think, yeah. unfortunately, the less capacity you have, the more you tend to fall into tech solutionism of different mm -hmm. sorts. Uh, and this is where, you know, the hackathons and the things to solve all the problems in the world tend to come in. Um, and I think that is partially where uh, I like to think that it's going to be a really set of interesting conversation to be had moving forward. Yeah, exactly. So I think the, from both of your responses, I mean, the one, again, the, the common thread, if you will, is actually around state capacity. So it's not so much perhaps a, having a spe very specific digital capacities. And this is where I, I'd like to bring our, our audience in because we have had uh, loads of questions already. And there are two questions that are very similar uh, from uh, Afreen and Wolfgang, actually. So I'm trying to combine these questions. And they both sort of ask in a similar way about the European and Asian responses. So we're sort of lumping all of this together. But I mean, it is interesting that uh, while Europe has, has sort of been seen as, as, uh, as one of the perhaps more advanced in, in digital sense, its responses have been much lower. And, uh, and Asia, exactly the opposite, as, as Julia was talking. There is a partially, of course, because of historical reasons. And again, it, it sort of um, points us that maybe it's not only the digital or industrial policy capacities even, but actually the wider sort of set of state capacities, having the legitimacy, having the, as, as Julia was just mentioning, having the confidence as the government of Singapore. And, and or is it, or is it still about uh, more specific? Or, 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 or what, what are the reasons that the responses fell out so differently? I mean, many European countries still do not have any uh, tracing apps or they don't even develop them anymore. Hmm. Well, let me disagree with how you framed the question. I, I don't think so. I think that actually Europe overall, um, I mean, I have a few points to make on this. I think uh, Europe overall is having a very, good response to the pandemic. I mean, with uh, the exclusion of some populist uh, uh, governments like the UK, uh, I mean, the majority of the European countries are responding uh, very, uh, I mean, timely uh, with large scale response. I mean, strengthening the healthcare system. Uh, I mean, putting massive resources into the economy, mobilizing their capacity. But first of all, uh, strengthening the healthcare system, which has been at the very core of the of the first, uh, let's say, emergency, and now not to risk that the healthcare emergency becomes also an economic emergency. Well, I mean, actually, this is a, a probably we have never seen such a mobilization of state capacity in peacetime. 
in our history. So I think actually it's an historical moment. And I have to say that Germany, Italy, France, Spain, I mean, lots of the um, European countries have shown, uh, well, a very good response without falling into, you know, this kind of uh, big state, top-down Orwellian uh, kind of uh, uh, scenarios. So I think in particular, when we talk about contact tracing applications, um, at the beginning, actually, the only model that was brought into the kind of public attention was China. And, and I mean, the way that the Chinese also tackled the pandemic is pretty impressive. But we have to say that, you know, a lot of the, of the way in particular to kind of find the trade off between um, uh, the need of um, yeah, I mean, the need of the kind of public uh, healthcare, uh, you know, response on one side, and then uh, the privacy and security and rights of their citizens, I mean, find this kind of compromise between the two has been very hard in, if you follow the kind of Chinese model, because things that they are doing, uh, aggregating, you know, citizens' data, uh, putting cameras everywhere, uh, putting apps everywhere, the kind of like, you know, control and track and track citizens all the time, they're not possible in countries. Uh, I mean, in, in, other, in other jurisdictions. And so I think I'm pretty proud of the European response, which has been very much uh, putting privacy, security, and ethics at the center of the technology response, but at the same time, uh, being able to strengthen the healthcare system. So as Julia saying, avoiding technological determinism, because the, the point of the contact tracing application is not the digital part, which of course can, can if used by a large scale a population. So it has to be used by maybe uh, 30, 40, 60, uh, uh, but depending on the, on the healthcare system that you have at the territorial level, uh, percent of the population. But the point there is the manual contact tracing, the territorial healthcare system, the strengthening of the capacity to track the virus, to, uh, to, you know, to basically contain the outbreaks and then to do the vaccine and the test. I mean, not, the vaccine is not available yet, but the, the testing and the, well, tamponi that we call it in, in Italy in order to, to see, um, I mean, to monitor the pandemic. This is the core of the problem. So the digital tool just help the system to react in a better way. So it makes it maybe more responsive and faster. But I mean, a lot of government have been employing new manual contact tracer. They've been putting money in the healthcare system only in this way, the digital contact tracing app can be of any use. So given, I mean, having said that, it is very important to be minimal. I mean, to why do you need to gather in a centralized way all this data to do what? So again, governments, before saying we want to put data everywhere and we want to gather more data and we want to centralize application, they should ask for, for, for what? <laughs> to do what we need that data. And then you will see that actually the decentralized uh, infrastructure that, uh, I mean, it is true that we have a different infrastructural monopoly problem there. But I think that we should analyze because in the future this is going to be very important because of course it is deployed in the operating system of two companies that have the monopoly over, over operating system. So it has been dictated in a sense by two companies, two nation states. So this is a very important point. But at the same time, the reason why they choose this decentralized and privacy enhancing approach, it was because of a bottom-up movement. You also have to recognize that in Europe, the architecture that Apple, actually more than Google, I'm pushing also Google to go along, has been choosing, which is decentralized privacy financing, keep the data in the mobile phone and so on. The, the first architecture was built by privacy and security researchers of excellent European universities, funded with public money. I mean, our public consortium of experts built the architecture. And then Apple and Google, in conversation with them, decided to, to, to take that as a model and as a system and scale it up. So actually, it doesn't really come from the business angle. It came from, you know, recognizing that this trade-off between security and privacy and public health had to be made because there was a very big demand coming from the population. 
And this and 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 the, and, and the work has been done by our um, security researchers. So I think it's a bit more complex. And then governments, okay, you know, they have to start recognizing that this kind of architecture for healthcare, which are decentralized, we have a minimum use of data that protect privacy, that give more agency to people, so give more data sovereignty to the, to the, to the citizens, are the future, and they should bet on that, because in that way you build the capacity of the entire society to be more aware about the consequences of the use of data, to be able to decide what data you share, uh, for what purpose, who owns the data, and how this data affects all the different decisions that are made, but at the same time building state capacity in critical areas like healthcare or like education and so on, where it is needed a, a, a bigger um, public control. So I think it's a, it's a very complex question, but I, I, I mean, I, I'm really positive about actually uh, the response that Europe had. And I think we can, we can show that it's possible to do these things in a different way. Just to close uh, this intervention, I also wanted to say to Julio that actually, you know, to, to talk about digital in separation from healthcare, education, mobility, at this point, it's no longer possible. I mean, if we look now, what are the big choices that are made? I mean, when you talk about healthcare, Yes, it is digi digi digitized. As you say, there is telemedicine. The use of data is, is very strong. Um, you're going to have to put a new type of infrastructures and tools everywhere. So these choices will affect also the governance structure and the economic structure and the, no, and the, and, and the impact of the entire sector. And this is the same thing with education. At the moment, you know, we are making decisions that will determine the future of education, I think, big ways. So it is not possible anymore to disentangle and separate completely what is the digital and how the digital is affecting this critical area of societies like healthcare, like education, like mobility, and so on. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just to, there are also some comments coming in, and also probably my framing was very much from where, from where I'm sitting, which is the UK context with a the failed apps uh, <laughs> yes. and, and all those uh, uh, and failing response yeah, and failing response as well yeah exactly so that's probably played a role as well so uh, but julia yeah so over to you around the question around in, uh, asia's response and and it's 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 perhaps a yeah, policy space that it has uh well it's interesting i think the question came from Wolfgang, right so i would invite everybody to read his blog on uh, uh Confucian and Weberian views of uh, bureaucracies, which are yes. in terms of COVID. Um, but anyway, so apart from that, um, you know, I think uh, one of the things that um, for us has been, again, so, you know, we spent quite a lot of time talking to people inside governments and trying to understand what was happening, right? And Rainer, you've been part a little bit of that as well. Mm. And, and uh, one of the things that, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious is, with hindsight, obviously, is that under condition of duress and response, uh, you have, uh, you know, a very limited number of options if you've not made investments before. Uh, and in a sense, you need to work with what you have uh, and, and from that, you know, see what you can create, repurpose, creatively adapt, and making very fundamental choices but at the beginning so for instance you know it's a bit of a, of a silly comparison but still you know so my parents in italy in able to be able to go out during lockdown had to print a form uh and which was changing every other day right and, and exhibit it to whatever you know policeman or whoever would ask them for this form right while at the same time i was interviewing people in, in, in Pakistan, who were receiving their, their cash transfer for mobile phones, right? Um, and, and, and I'm not saying it needs to be facetious, but it's literally the question of what you have available right now, right? And what you have invested in before. Uh, and if you have more options and if you have more investment, then you can creatively repurpose, adapt, build things on top of it uh, in, in all sorts of forms and shapes, right? So. Indian railways repurposed uh, thousands of carriages to become uh, ambulances, right? De facto, 
uh, because you have that infrastructure available and you're able to creatively work with it and do things with it. If you don't have a massive railway like they have in India, then it becomes uh, questionable, right? What is available, what you can do with it. And so all I'm saying is that I think, again, so a combination of a number of different factors, and obviously every country is very different, but, you know, uh, uh, things have worked out in, uh, in Asia in conditions where obviously governments took some very bold decision, created, you know, we're talking about extraordinary numbers, right? So uh, India with all, you know, it's botched um, decisions in many different ways, but has actually uh, been able to distribute or at least plan to distribute uh, cash transfer to 200 million women. Uh, in in Pakistan, I'm talking about 15 mi million families that were affected, in, in, uh, just to begin with, and I'm growing. Uh, so, I mean, the numbers are quite staggering. And again, you know, this was possible thanks to existing infrastructure um, and, and existing options that were available. Uh, by the same token, you know, there's been some really interesting research looking at where R&D went for coronavirus uh, research in the last 10 years. And if you look at it, you will see this, you know, it's, it's a chart that moves from, from the West and going to the East, right? And, and you see all the center of research are moving towards China, uh, different parts of Korea, different parts of, of Asia, because, you know, obviously, uh, uh, having suffered from SARS, this has become a, a big priority and governments have invested big time in here. Uh, and so I think this is a, you know, part of this question for me has been what were some of these legacies uh, before some of the things that were available, but then combined with some really bold decisions that have been taken, have actually made some of these uh, responses available. Uh, and here again, the other question is how much political will to take this decision and shape in the way that Francesca is encouraging us to think about it, right, is going to happen. So, for instance, here in Thailand, the government has just made uh, an announcement that it's going to redirect R&D funds uh, towards companies, small and medium company enterprises, and the ones that actually are going to be focusing on uh, uh, sustainable business models and uh, most vulnerable populations. These type of decisions are eventually the ones that I think are going to determine in the longer term uh, how we come out of this crisis. And these are decisions that, uh, again, as Francesca said, are being taken now. So I think one, one issue we haven't mentioned, I think, with, 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 which played a huge role in, in those instances that Julia was mentioning is the role of digital identity as, as part of the digital infrastructure, if you will that perhaps wasn't used um, so much before in, in, in those countries, but then became hugely helpful uh, for uh, cash transfers, for instance, among the populace. So I think my, my next question actually is around exactly the role of these kind of digital infrastructures like the identity, but also other issues. And uh, uh, the issues that we started from, I think you mentioned Francesca and uh, the gig economy and the, the casualization of labor and to those people being at the forefront, but also uh, something that they have seen, seen before, uh, in other places, uh, almost in all places, is, is sort of the emergence of the, of the gender issues or the re-emergence of the, of the gender issues in terms of who does the homework, who does the kids schooling and all those issues. And, and so that what are the in inter interactions, if you will, between these digital infrastructures and those issues around equity? And again, do you see responses that you think could be something that, that we can hold on in the future as well or build on that or to, to for instance, uh, to decrease um, inequalities in societies, whether it's in education, whether it's actually in, in healthcare or whether it's, it's around um, uh, gender, gender pay caps and things like that. Oh, well, I think uh, we are just getting more aware of these uh, inequalities because the impact that this pandemic is having, as you're saying, on uh, specific segments of the population, uh, I mean, like the gig workers or, or I mean, the, the precarization of society, it is much more visible now. And even uh, a lot of these kind of uh, precarious workers really struggle even to access uh, the new kind of benefits and the new economic benefits that the government is putting out there because they just do not enter in any statistics. They are really the invisible. I mean, here in Italy, for instance, we have a huge problem with uh, farmers. 
uh, that are, I mean, like undocumented farmers that are absolutely essential in this moment because they're helping a lot of our industries in the south to continue to produce uh, good food and to, co to continue to, I mean, serve the population in particular during lockdown. And they are undocumented migrants which work as slaves in countrysides without any coverage any social protection and they're really invisible to the unions to the health i mean to the healthcare system to the provision system and so on and i think i mean this is um a part that happened of the here in, in leicester have, as well that it, happened in yeah. leicester here in uk so it's yeah <laughs> so that we are also seeing of course i mean but this is a part but also it, a precarization goes through the society in big ways i mean yeah we mentioned the gig workers which have been keeping us alive during this pandemic of working for the big uh, uh, digital platforms. And I mean, being actually also excluded from uh, public health care and from this, uh, uh, you know, uh, provision of uh, social uh, protection and so on, and really struggle. A lot of this is black economy. And then you, you mentioned, of course, the impact on women, which is huge. I mean, during the pandemic, if you think about care work, and the kind of nurses and the, and the workers in the healthcare sector. And then women being at home, uh, working in distance with the child and they have to take care. So I mean, there is all this kind of care economy, the welfare economy, the invisible economy, which we basically just realized as many uh, actually, you know, theorists were saying for a long time that these are essential work in the economy. And now it's, it's emerging as, as a possible, I mean, as a core of what keeps society alive, which is not remunerated by the way that this economy works, because they, they are not taking into account in the structure of the society. So I think these are the type of structural changes that we have to see. And on top of that, I think another divide is obviously, well, in Italy, we definitely have the South-North. I mean, but in other places is the city countryside, the, the global south and the global north. I mean, all these kind of territorial divides. I mean, also that they are really made more visible with this, with this current crisis. So we need to make sure that now that we redirect again, all these massive, you know, uh, I mean, we, we are really restructuring the economy big way, I think at this point. And we have to be, make, make sure that we don't create more inequalities and widening this kind of structural problems with society and um, but but we we act to to make them i mean to go to the root of the cause and i think you know one big big part of, of our awakening has been the anti-racial movement in the us of course during the crisis because we realized you know the black communities i mean uh, racism um you know they were the, the, the ones that were most hit by the crisis and the uprising and the mobilization of that movement made us realize that you know this is this is the core of the problem structural inequalities and i think um in this in this respect and maybe we haven't talked about it we talk, we talk a lot about national states but actually cities are absolutely active in in uh, being at the forefront of addressing these structural inequalities mobilizing communities uh giving more power to communities also julio mentioned in the very beginning how can citizens and communities take their i mean participate be more active self-organize because you know we need also to to create this capacity in society of communities to self-organize to uh to address the these structural issues by you know having more power and more resources and i think at the city level you see some of these things addressed you know in the kind of um housing plans uh, in the in the green recoveries, where, where you know the cities being replanned around an, a different idea of the green cities, um, yeah, co co working housing systems that are I mean that are uh, basic universal access to housing, which is a big question, and so on. So yeah, I think I think we're going to see different responses from different level of governance, maybe, and we have to try it to make sure that digitization in this in this in this sense doesn't deepen these inequalities even stronger so i think that's why we need to rebalance i mean to to really put people i mean not not to to create more monopolies and more concentration of power but to put technology at the service of communities and people thanks francesca and julia how do you, how do you see that from uh, from your perspective yeah so i think you know uh Digital ideas has, has come up uh, very strongly as an issue uh, 
in, for better or for worse, right, uh, out of this response, at least in Asia. And uh, this, again, not only because governments have made uh, a, a, an ample use of it, uh, but also because of a decision that are embedded in determining what is an identity, right? And who is in and who is out is obviously a very political decision in many different ways, right? Um, so, you know, and, and this goes from purely the technical elements of it. So, for example, uh, biometrics failing uh, in many cases. Uh, things like, for example, fingerprint recognition not working for people with disabilities uh, in, in some places, right? Um, and uh, discrimination based on uh, religious grounds, right? Uh, who's in and who's out, depending on different countries. So being able to determine uh, identity has been a real uh, big issue. And because when your life depends on cash transfer or safety nets from the government, that's really literally a life and death decision. So you might have seen it, one of the questions around, again, the lockdown in India where all these uh, internal uh, migrants, back to a distinction between cities and rural, what Francesca was talking about, had to, to, to do with, uh, you know, walk uh, literally for weeks uh, to go back to their villages because they lost their job in the big cities. Part of a the problem there was that uh, their uh, ID and their, it was not necessarily interoperable with the states they were walking through. And so they were actually literally didn't have access to, to any um, money in the places where they, they were traversing, right? So they were walking through. Uh, so issues like this, when, for example, quite a lot of uh, migrant coming back in this region from all, you know, from the Gulf, from all sorts of other places, uh, not having a mo local mobile phone, which wouldn't be able to allow them to be identified for a number of different systems. I mean, literally the question of uh, identity has created uh, both has been on one hand a hero and on the other hand has created really quite a lot of fundamental questions around how to determine it, what are the conditions, uh, and even in, in places where the intentions were just there, just for example, recognizing all of a sudden uh, millions of uh, foreign mobile phone numbers, uh, it's just logistically being a, a really difficult thing to, to, to use and just to determine for this. So I think this, this has become really uh, one of the big questions around that. I think uh, issues that have come up again quite quite uh, strongly in our cases is uh, a number of different refugees, right? Uh, people living in slums, uh, being excluded in also different levels. And also, I don't think we, we you know, there's been enough talk about it, but uh, people with disabilities of all different types, uh, you know, from, from the basic things, but for example, if you're wearing a mask, uh, it's impossible to uh, read your uh, lips, right, for people who have to do so, uh, all the way to uh, different questions around contactless services and all these other things have really exacerbated many of the issues that were, uh, were before. Uh, I think in that sense, uh, again, so you know, in many different respects, uh, as Francesca was saying, uh, it's just things that were there before have already been uh, made visible. Now, let me just say one positive thing, um, which, because it's one story that has really struck us, even if it doesn't come from our region, but uh, we, we interviewed the mayor of Freetown uh, who ran her election on the premise of raising property tax for the richer. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in her town, this actually was a matter that not, not having data on the property owned by people, they had to rely on satellite data to make the approximation. But the story is, well, this was done before COVID and when COVID hit, and so she had the choices to either completely renege on her manifesto and say, well, you know, we need to have the money, whatever else, et cetera. She actually doubled down. And so she went ahead with uh, FAT saying the people who have, can afford it need to share the burden with the people who cannot. Um, and this has been, uh, you know, an inspiring story for us in many different ways, but in terms of actually the possibility of taking the tough choices that Francesca is talking about, uh, it's a matter of uh, having a condition, a political condition to do so, but also the leadership and, and the willingness to actually push forward with decisions that might be unpopular. And it's, it's really interesting to go and to see whether we are able to take this decision or not.
Well, uh, Rainer, maybe we yeah. want to also add that um, during the anti-racist mobilization in the US, I mean, or due to that, actually there was a very strong debate about algo-racism and the way that facial recognition and other type of pervasive technologies were used to discriminate people without accountability, without any algorithmic um, audit uh, to see, you know, what, what, what do these systems do? And, uh, and of course, they were so dangerous that uh, even the big companies, I mean, maybe also for a market opportunity during this, this, this moment, but they even call out for a moratorium uh, in order to basically sort out the kind of framework, the democratic framework, to be able to deploy such technologies. And of course, as we know, many cities around the world have been asking for a ban of this kind of technologies. I mean, I mentioned this because they're very much linked also to digital IDs and digital payments. So there are many places where facial recognition, digital ID and digital payments are definitely integrated into the system. And when you use those technologies so integrated, on one side, you have the problem of concentration of economic power if they are in the hands of a very few big players. But on the other hand, you also have the question of uh, accountability and the democratic framework that can assess that there is no discriminatory use of those technologies, which of course, if it's in healthcare and education and uh, housing and so on, it will discriminate access to basic essential, again, services of society. So I think yeah. maybe when we are talking about these fundamental services, that's where the agents, the public agency, become really critical. And there are some countries where this question, I mean, you're from Estonia, of course, is one of those countries where the question of people like digital ID being a public infrastructure has been posed long time ago. And I have to say that now it becomes very important. There are lots of questions about digital payments and central banks coming up with lots of reports yeah. about the digital currency, maybe having to be managed by central banks or what, how you know to balance that with the FinTech or with the, with the, the private payment markets and how to do that. Uh, and then, of course, a question that's very dear to me, on top of all this infrastructure, of course, we gather data. And I think that what we said also, how then you mobilize data for the public interest and for the public good and turning data into a public infrastructure is also, of course, a very important part of the question. So maybe digging into the digital, we are realizing the layers of this digital infrastructure, even if you want to ally it, like, because we want a strong competition on top, but some of these layers have to be democratically governed and controlled because otherwise we're going to, uh, oh, I mean, we're going to go into this, this dystopic um, situation. Right, I, I was just about to, to say that, that it's interesting that, uh, that while the digital responses have been in some cases more impressive than in others and digital infrastructure has been really important, but of course also, in some cases, perhaps being slightly slow and paper-based, as in, in your parents' case in Italy, uh, Julia, perhaps isn't so bad because it, <laughs> it also avoids uh, many of the pitfalls. So I think this is the uh, more sort of a, let's say, the Weberian Retro, approach. yeah. Yeah, no, well, it's a, it's a combination. So I think we are we're exactly, exactly at the end of our, our time already. So the time has really flown by. And, and we could sort of um, uh, point to to these critical issues, if, if you will. But I, I wanted to ask both of you as a last, like really short answer is, um, uh, and the question is about what are the, I don't know, like news or what, what should we be looking out for? Where, do, where should we be uh, looking for key critical news or items around digital transformation? Is it about the big, big tech? Is it about the identity? What, is, what, is, what are you looking for to see like, you know, the green shoots as they're called, signs of positive change, if you will? I think, as I said, uh, maybe a few times in this conversation, for me, I mean, the, re the real thing now is di redirecting the digital uh, to support, I mean, basically giving a direction 
to the digital right. uh, that will support you know a better education and better healthcare and the green digital transi and the green transition. I think that's what we have to focus on. So mm -hmm. not looking at the digital as a sector as a bubble that can get out of control and then the governments have to step in later to clean the mess when things are <laughs> yeah, are dangerous or where we have to ban we have to put taxation we have to try to govern what's ungovernable. No, I think that now we have to play a more active role into co-shaping this direction and making sure that we uh, ask the question of, um, well, maybe, yeah, it is a, a, a question of um, how to redistribute the, the wealth and the value in society and how to take advantage of this uh, digital transition for the people and for, uh, you know, greening our economy to better redistribute power in society, to fight precarization of labor for a better health care and a better education. I think for me, this is where I look for innovation. In the, in the future. So maybe more in the kind of care, welfare, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but, but then at that, really using, using leveraging the power of digital technologies and, and do that, yeah, not in a technocratic way, so not top down, uh, but also mobilizing the power of communities and putting the, the question of democratic control at the center. Thank you. And Julia? Yeah, I'll say, you know, one place where not to look for is uh, in, you know, moving fast and breaking things, right? <laughs> and uh, it's, in a sense, but, you know, out of joke, this is a bit of a conversation we are trying to have with uh, governments at different level in the region and saying, look, if not Silicon Valley, then what? Uh, and what are, you know, what are the modalities to set that direction that Francesca is talking about? And to me, the places that are going to create alternative narrative that are based more on a different set of values actually have a major competitive advantage moving forward. I mean, obviously, we have a biased view on this. We think the SDGs are not, uh, play a major role in that, but, you know, uh, proving that argument is going to be really fundamental. Uh, but I think that's actually where the opportunity is. And again, if you look at it under this lens, when you can start looking at places around the world, including in this region, and, it, and often is not, you know, the most talked about places in my experience, right? So you really, we, we did a, a number of horizon scanning exercises to look at different places where you see the beginnings of different conversation around the use of, of technology, how it has been done, you know, and I will always mention this, but you know, uh, Nepal is the only place that I know in the world where I have a national innovation center that is funded by poor people. Uh, and and uh, funded through uh, soon a hydroelectrical company. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's different models. If one actually starts looking at them, the question is how do you move them from, you know, the periphery to actually the mainstream and how do you persuade governments and decision makers that taking different type of choices and coming up with alternative models actually can uh, is a is a is really a way to to build yeah. credibility in the future of a country and i think that's a really interesting discussion to be had. i love the fact that uh, the both of you came at the end sort of with the main topic of our our, our series which is public purpose during covid <laughs> <laughs> basically that is exactly the, the all answer. carefully planned right <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes, as, as if, yeah. Anyway, so um, it's 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 already um, uh, after after our time and Julia for you it's already very late. So thanks thanks so much for staying up with us and uh, and talking to us and Francesca the same. Thanks so much for joining and uh, let me just quickly share the screen because this is the, our next event, uh, which is uh, actually already next uh, next Monday. So we have a, a next event is about rethinking employment. And this is a, a part, the case for a job guarantee program. And we will have a Robert Stidelsky, Professor Pavina Cerneva, and uh, Aurora Laluk. And uh, so we have a, a also a political representation, if you will, uh, happening. And so thanks so much for everybody joining. Join us again next Monday. And Julia, good night. Francesca, uh, hopefully, good dinner. <laughs> and everybody's yes. joined. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.